So welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about uh, manufacturing a recipe for differentiation. And we have with us Paul Van Meter. And he's the co-founder of Pro Shop ERP. So welcome, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate being here. Absolutely, man. Looking forward to talking with you. How are things going for you today in Washington? Uh, it's chilly out today. It's uh, mid-February and it's in the upper teens, which is unusual for us. But yeah. uh, besides the cold weather, things are going great. Well, that's great. I mean, North Carolina's not much better right now. It's it's it's, it's raining. It's nasty, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we're going to have fun today, uh, no matter what the weather is. You bet. So, you know, you, we, we were talking, getting ready for this conversation and, and to get us going, maybe break down how have you seen the evolution of technology to help manufacturers meet those changing market needs? It's a great question. I was thinking about that. You know, I think in a large degree, technology is what drives the changing market needs, right? Um, uh, 3D printing is a great example, right? So 3D printing was invented, evolved over the years, and now it's really become you know, a huge part of manufacturing. And so all these manufacturers are going out buying 3D printers, buying hybrid machines that can 3D print and machine in the same machine. Um, so just uh, you know, one little example of, of this technology that is actually driving new ways to manufacture, new uh, things that are driving then the manufacturing process itself, right? Because then, of course, that technology allows things to be made in different ways, things that could never have been possible before. Um, and then that drives the market demand to buy those machines. Right, right. You know, and I know you work specifically with a lot of machine shops and fab shops. And I thought that was really cool. Like when I when I saw your solution, and it really, I was like, man, I wish I'd have known that guy years ago when we had our motor shop. He could have really helped us. I mean, it was a really cool solution you have there. Thank you. You know, so so when you're talking about those machine shops, you know, what are some common headwinds that you see those guys face? Uh, that that kind of limit their ability to scale, if you will. Yeah. Well, you know, most machine shops are started by machinists or programmers or people that are craftsmen in their trade, right? right. Um, and not a lot of them have a lot of business experience, right? Which is not a, you know, not their fault. They just, they grew up, you know, learning machining, learning programming, fabrication, whatever it is, welding. And uh, they got really good at it, and they said, "You know what? I could do this better than my than my boss." Um, but that means they don't have a lot of the the kind of skills and knowledge that comes with owning a business. So, um, a big one that I see for a lot of companies is marketing and sales. You know, not nearly enough shops are sales driven, which means that they see this crazy highs and lows in their revenue. You know, they have a great boom month and then the next month is really dead, which devastates their cash flow. Um, so that is that is tough on any business, but especially in job shop type businesses, if you don't have a steady stream, that's a huge limit to, to scaling and growth. Um, another one we see is not, bracing, not embracing technology. Um, you know, to the degree that it, that it actually differentiates you. Um, so, you know, prime example, it's, it's never, it's probably never been easier to start a shop these days, right? You can go out and buy, you know, a nice vertical mill for, you know, way under a hundred thousand dollars and you can buy a five axis mill for a little over a hundred thousand. It's, it's incredible. And uh, speaking of technology, um, but, uh, but that means the barriers to entry are, are low, but that doesn't necessarily differentiate, you know, buying one of those machines that everyone else has isn't enough to differentiate you and both sort of put you ahead from a, from a marketing perspective and sort of what your capabilities are in terms of delivering solutions to clients. So a lot of shops try to try to accommodate for that by just saying, you know, we have excellent, you know, customer support and quality and delivery, like we'll always come through for you. That's what they say on their websites. Um, but everyone is saying that, so it's not enough. Um, and I'd say the last one is recruiting and growing talent. Uh, as almost every shop owner knows, it is hard to find machinists or any kind of skilled, you know, skilled workers, uh, good welders, good fabricators. Um, and so that, that pool is not big enough and it's not growing fast enough because new young people are not going into the market uh, at nearly the rate that the people that are retiring uh, are leaving. Uh, 
And again, just like bringing it, trying to find a customer, you know, you got to sell your shop to those potential employees because they have a lot of places to choose from because everyone's looking. So I'd say that's another area where shops uh, could really often use help um, and definitely limits their ability to scale and grow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and those are so common areas for many industries, but shops in particular, Paul, I mean, we're, you know, I'm just thinking back through our old days at Eco when we had the motor shop and, and that, that recruiting piece, when you, when you said that at the end, I, I still had hairs come up on the back of my neck just because I know how hard it is to find a machinist. And we were, yeah. we were doing a lot of manual machining, you know, primarily, sure. uh, try to find people who know how to run lays and hold those tolerances. Uh, that, that is a, a, a tough skill to, to find. And, and when you get it, you, you want to take care of them and, uh, and the, the whole sales piece and, and embracing technology. I just thought that was three great areas that you, that you covered there. Yeah. I was on a call yesterday. Um, and there were some shops in Chicago and one of them said that there are, I think something like 50,000 open openings right now for machinists in Chicago. Wow. 50,000. <laughs> There's not 50,000 machinists looking for a job in Chicago. Right. I can tell you that. Right. So those shops are, are all competing to find, you know, to get that best talent. Yeah. Um, and they really have to differentiate themselves in a way that makes those machinists want to come work for them. And then when they get there, they need to love it. Right. They need to feel supported. They need to feel like they have autonomy. They need to feel like they can do good work. Um, and not every shop provides that provides the environment for people to, to feel that way. Yeah. Cause I mean, like you mentioned to get started, I mean, so many of these shop owners were good machinists and, and they don't have that, you know, the, the foundations of building a business, like you mentioned, and the, the sales and marketing is usually the farthest thing from their mind. And it's, it's really so important to keep that funnel and that pipeline full. Yeah. 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 When we, uh, when we ran our shop, um, we we worked really hard on our culture um we made sure that uh that all the things that i just mentioned were just sort of cornerstones um in our company and uh it really made a big difference you know we definitely had employees seeking us out asking to come work for us and so we that and some other things like working with the local tech colleges you know we always had the employees that we needed to grow, which I think was a big differentiator in how we grew so fast compared no to a lot of our competitors. No doubt. Absolutely. And, you know, as we, as we're moving through the conversation, one thing that, that came up when we were brainstorming together was talking about data and data mm -hmm. that helps these businesses get better. So what, what are some of those data points that you see where that, that really helped uh, those businesses the most? You know, um, well, first of all, a lot of shops don't have the data. Um, they, uh, but uh, there's a few key ones. Uh, job costing, the importance of that can't be understated. It's remarkable how many shops have no idea which jobs they make money on and which jobs they don't. So they're just, I mean, they have a gut feel, right? They yeah. say, oh, this job was worth three grand and it took us five days. So that's right. probably not good, yeah. right? Um, or it took one day and that sounds good. Um, so job costing is huge. Uh, capacity planning and scheduling is definitely another one that every shop fights with and deals with, right? When they get an when they get an RFQ, when they get a new job, how do they know they can deliver to their customer on time, right? Mm -hmm. It's really tough. Job shops are an incredibly dynamic environment, right? There's always things changing, things getting pulled in, things getting pushed out, material not showing up, tools missing you know, someone's out sick, right? And they're the only one that knows how to set up that job. So just really, really tough environment. Um, and then probably the last big one would be their quality metrics, right? What is their first pass yield? Like how often when they go to set up a job, right. is their first part good, right? Yeah. And then yeah. when they're running production, are they really keeping tabs on the process, right? Are they mm -hmm. monitoring that, uh, that machining process, that, that uh, every part that comes out, are they inspecting it? Do they know, you know, what the variables are that might affect, you know, whether something's going in and out of tolerance? Um, yeah. And so a lot of a lot of shops, you know, don't don't do enough checking, I think, or they do it on paper. And they don't have an easy way to aggregate that data to look at it across the whole company. And know we've even heard stories of of, you know, of an operator running parts, writing down on the sheet the the results that they are checking 
not realizing that the results they're writing down are actually already out of tolerance, but they just, they just misunderstood. It was a plus minus, you know, variable dimension. And they're like, they thought it was all right, but it wasn't. And they ran all day making bed parts. So Man, it, um, it, yeah, it, he, getting that stuff dialed in can make a huge difference no in, doubt. in profitability and then subsequently growth of a client, of a company. I, I, I got to ask this because just because of my background, so this is a little bit selfish. And I think our COO who may listen to this, he'll, he'll smile at this. Have you worked with any um, motor repair shops with this type of, with your solution at ProSoft, ProShop, I'm uh, sorry. No worries. Um, you know, I we have not we have not worked with any motor repair shops. The reason but. the reason I'm asking everything you're talking about were were areas that 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 were important to us. You know that we had job costing. I remember the conversations. How do we know we we made you know how much money we made on on a job? And right. we had to, we built a system to, to to manage the cost structure. And we we ended up doing a homegrown system. But I can only mm -hmm. imagine so many shops out there that are asking that same question about <laughs> what jobs do I make money on or what jobs do I mm -hmm. not? And, and how, where do I sit like right now in the middle right. of this job? Uh, yep. How much, do, how much time do I have left? You know, and, and, and are we profitable? Are we head schedule or not? There's just so many things. And that scheduling piece is so huge too, because you're right. It, if you've never been in a shop environment, you don't know how dynamic it is. It's, it's, it's moving fast. It's one of the hardest kind of businesses to run, yep. just bar none in the world. It is. Right? It is. <laughs> Incredibly difficult. That's right. Which is why it really underscores, you know, someone that that is a brilliant machinist programmer and they're like, I can do this on my own. And they get into it and they realize they're just up to their head in stuff that they're not good at. Right. Um, and they passionately care and they try really hard. But it's tough. It's yeah. really tough. It really is. And, and the quality piece you're talking about, that was that's big. That that stands out to me. We had to build, uh, you know, just just we just hard coded in some tolerances, and so mm -hmm. we were doing simple stuff, bearing fits and things like that. But knowing what those yeah. bearing fits are and making sure oh, yeah. the bearing fits are right, and as we're measuring them and things like that, that quality piece is so important. So, you know, when you're looking at the data that's out there, because we would have data you know, off from our machining, but as well as from some of our testing. So is the data that the shops are using, is it, is it just segmented? And, and that, and what you're, you're saying is we didn't, we need to centralize it. Is that kind of what I'm hearing here? Yeah. I mean, if you don't have it at all, you need to collect it. You need to get some system to you to, to create it and use it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of shops, like I said, that don't have job costing. Right. Um, right. And that could be for a number of reasons. They either just don't have a system that can generate it, or they have a system that theoretically generates it, but it's so cumbersome that they don't actually use it, right? Um, I've heard that story countless times. Um, we're, using the, we're using this other software. Yeah, it has job costing, but it doesn't work quite well enough, and it's so much work to get the numbers out that we don't end up doing it because we're so busy. The job ships, we're straight on to the next one. We don't even have time to look. Yeah, we'll figure it right. out later, right? <laughs> But, um, but those that do have it often have it, like you said, very segmented. Uh, so they have their main ERP system that gives them hopefully job costing. Um, but they, you know, they, they, it doesn't have any real quality functions, for example. So then they buy some other software um, to manage their, their inspection reports, or they're just doing it on paper. And that's, that's very segmented. You know, it's sitting in a filing cabinet and you don't know it's there unless you pull out the cabinet and look. Um, and again, it's just, it's a ton of overhead costs to manage different data and copy and paste and put it in spreadsheets from paper that someone on the floor collected and try to do that. And it's just, you know, and the, the challenge with that, especially in manufacturing and in job shops is that the margins are so slim because the competition is so fierce that there's just no time. There's no, there's no, there's no resources to, to take all that desperate data and put it into something that makes sense to try to make smart decisions. They're just, it's too, it's too big of an uphill battle. Yeah. So it just doesn't often happen. So true. So true. So that kind of, that leads us right into what we were talking about for this conversation too, Paula, that, that recipe for uh, differentiation. So you, if, when you think through and trying to help some of these businesses, what are some of the core items that, that, that you think manufacturers could could take advantage of to make the largest the largest impact in their industry. 
you know, we had a, a machine shop here in, in Western Washington, you know, and there are hundreds of shops in Western Washington because Boeing is here and there's a big, it's a big aerospace area. Um, and we had nice machines, but so do all of our competitors. So one thing that we decided to focus on was that just made us stand out from our competition in a, in a little bit of a different way was we decided to focus on really being an engineering partner with our customers and and give them uh, sort of as much value and free advice on on design for manufacturability and how they can reduce the cost of their parts that we're making. So we started by because you know I'm sure every single shop out there, especially machine shops or any shop that's making anything, they get drawings and models from their customers and they look at those and they're like, this is ridiculous. Look at these dimensions, look at these tolerances, look at these features. Like I can tell it doesn't need to be this hard, right? Um, but they have all these engineers designing these things that have no idea, right? They've never been in a machinist. They've never been a fabricator. They don't know, they, you know, they, they, they got their engineering degree, they got hired into this job and they're doing the best they can and they use this 3D CAD software that allows them to draw and tolerance anything in the world, <laughs> right? That's right. So we decided to focus on design for manufacturability. So we started simple with just a newsletter. You know, we would take real world parts that we were getting, you know, quotes on, and we'd take snapshots of the drawing or prints off the model, and we'd, we'd write up a little article about it. And we're like, this model, it has this kind of feature and that's causing this part to be like 40% more cost than if they change the feature a little bit, change this radius, change this tolerance. And we just started sending those out and um, our customers loved it. They're, they replied, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, thank you for this. And then some of them started asking, hey, would you come teach us, right? Rather than just reading your newsletter, would you come to our company and present to our engineers what you're talking about? And we we're like, okay, sure. So we developed like a half day DFM boot camp, right? We came in um, and we would spend about four hours present, you know, presenting to their whole engineering team. And they'd usually have buyers come as well and sit on it because they don't know anything about it either. Um, and it turned into a really significant uh, activity for us. And the reason that it was such a key thing for our company as a revenue generator is because those customers really started to trust us. And, and we also wouldn't even, you know, we were just, we gave and gave and gave, you know, there was no expectations that they were going to send us the work if they sent us a drawing to look at for them. Um, and then for some of our customers, it even became, Hey, would you come to our company on a weekly basis and have some sort of in-house office hours, right? Where our engineers could just go talk to you, or you can go talk to them at their desk and give them feedback on their designs. And we're like, absolutely, sure. And you know, just because we're going to help you on this does not necessarily mean we're going to make it for you. But it was a pretty good bet that if we were giving them feedback, they would say, Hey, would you quote this while we're at it? It's like, sure, we'll quote that. Right. Our other competitors were not doing that. Um, and that became a pretty big differentiator for us. So that's just one example of standing out above your other competitors um, in a way that's just really unique and different and providing value to your customers. And then the other one is, you know, I mentioned earlier how everyone says on their website that they have the best service and the best delivery and the best quality. But it's tough, you know, buyers, especially uh, that, that buy parts, you know, they, they can smell BS a mile away, right? They know that every, every shop out there says this. And when they come and visit you, you know, to, to audit you and decide whether they're going to put you on their vendor list, they are looking for proof that you can back up your claims. Right. I, I have I have a very good friend that was a buyer that bought parts from us and he's since retired, but we stay in contact. And he's like, Paul, I can go into any shop and within five minutes, I know if they're BSing me or not. Right. And what he's looking for are systems. 
And so that is another way to differentiate. It, it's hard. It's a little bit hard to do it just on your website. But when you start having a conversation with a buyer, with a potential customer, you need to talk about how you guarantee the claims you make on your site, right? That you have 99 plus percent delivery and quality, right? That you're not going to um, accidentally forget to order some material and realize until the job is due that you didn't make that part, right? Exactly. What are the, or that someone that your machinist on the shop floor isn't writing down a, you know, a result they think is good, but it's actually bad and they've scrapped the whole lot. And you don't realize that until you either send it to your customer because you don't have a good final inspection process or you catch it at final and it's too late. You got to re you got to remake all the parts. The job's going to be weeks late. Um, so, cause those, those things happen all the time. And so proving that you have a really robust process is what gives buyers the confidence to give you those purchase orders. Right. They want to, they want to know that when they place the order with you, they don't need to babysit you. They don't need to worry about it. Um, and it's, and it's just through sort of objective evidence and proof that they're going to believe that you, uh, can, can deliver on that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's two great examples. I mean, the, the, the whole newsletter, uh, idea, that's great, man. It sounds like it, it worked wonderful for you and, and, and it helps so many people. The second piece caught my attention when you were walking through that story, we actually built a, uh, a, a shop evaluation guide and we put that out on our website and we, we found that thing was downloaded. That was one of the most downloaded pieces of content we developed. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really geared towards us. It was trying to help our customers. And it was, it was for the motor shop industry specifically. But sure. if you're going into a, an electric motor shop and you wanted to look for, here's some systems you need to check for. Here's some areas for quality you need to check for. Here's some inventory items, you know, just mm -hmm. basic core competencies. Uh, and that sure. guy, it, it was really cool. That guy is still out there and it's just, it's, it's niche for that market, but it sounds very similar to kind of the audit process you were talking through. That's really smart. I need to do one of those for machine shops. Yeah. I'm <laughs> a machine shop idea. evaluation guy. I'm telling you that, that was yeah. a, that was a really good, and, yeah, and I'll be, I'll be glad to share that, 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 uh, content with you as well. But, uh, so, you know, along with that guy, that was a really a great area to, to help our customers just from an experience standpoint. So do you have any areas about customer experience and how, how that has been impacted through this process that you'd like to share? I sure do. Yeah. So, um, let's, uh, Matt, let's, let's talk for a second about hamburgers, right? You probably visit McDonald's on occasion, right? As we all do. And you know, that every time you go to McDonald's, that burger is going to be exactly the same as the last time, the, the taste and the shape and the flavor that you have come to love, right? So people, humans want consistency, right? They want to trust that when they go to do something or buy something, that it's going to be the same consistent experience as they are, that they, that they have gotten in the past, you know, same thing with like Disneyland, right? That's one of the models that they've, they built. So that is true in industrial manufacturing as well. Those buyers, those customers want to have a very consistent and personalized experience that is friction free and gives them and makes them feel like you, like they are your most important customer and you're spending all your effort making sure you get everything right for them. And the way that's done is through systems, right? You cannot, just tell your employees, hey, just be really nice and kind to this customer and they'll love us, right? They have so many little idiosyncrasies and things that they need and want. You know, they want, um, if they're an aerospace customer, they're, they're going to always ask you for an AS9102 report, right? That's the aerospace standard for an inspection report. Um, and so you got to make sure you deliver that format of that import report every time. If you build systems to guarantee that all of your, your employees and your process are going to execute per that customer's needs, that buyer is going to be happy. They're going to feel like they're getting a consistent experience from you and they will be loyal and keep ordering from you. No doubt. No doubt. And that, 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 that's a great analogy, tying it back to McDonald's. <laughs> it was Very true. relatable. Everyone understands that. Yeah, it's that. so relatable, man. Absolutely. And, and, and having that consistency uh, and, and I think just raising your, your expectations as a, as a consumer 
that, hey, sure. you know, I, I, I should be getting that from all my vendors and all the shops that I work with and things like that. So, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. that's great stuff, man. And, you know, speaking to the shops themselves and, and that are supporting industry, you mentioned earlier about the workforce attrition and how that mm -hmm. can be tough. I, I know training is a big area for you that you that you have worked with in the past. So how, how do you see that as helping uh, the, the attrition issue? So there's two big parts of this. One is attracting and growing um, new employees, right? As, as we talked about earlier, you know, baby boomers are retiring in droves. Um, there's just an amazing amount of talent and knowledge that is in the heads of these folks. And they're getting ready to, you know, take it easy for <laughs> the rest of their lives. And so, and there's not enough folks coming in. So we got to, you, you, you really need to put your best foot forward on your website, um, on the way that you recruit, the way even your social media, right? That's got to be something that's in your mind about making your company look like an attractive place to work. Right. And then when you um, do get someone, they, they have to love it and they have to feel like you are investing in them, right? You are coaching them, teaching them, giving them the tools and support they need, right? If you have a machinist that really just has a, a dream to be a programmer, <clears throat> then support them in that, right? Get them some programming classes or some, some references or materials. You know, if they decide that they just are, they love the quality area and they want to become the quality manager someday, then help support them in that, right? right. Um, it's, it's um, some of the practical tools. Uh, we've been doing it for years and years. It's one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings where you and your manager sit together one-on-one -on -one for you know 15 to 30 minutes, but do it like every week or every two weeks, right? Don't wait six months or a year to have a formal review. And you say, you know what? I'm not happy with your performance in the last six months. And right. you're like, well, why didn't you tell me? I want you to be happy. I want to do good things for this company. You know, most employees really care about doing a good job. They want to feel like they, their work matters. They want to feel like they matter. So uh, anyway, so that's really important. On the practical side of training, I think every shop should have a formalized process for um, creating training or you know, having training that they get delivered, um, having a process for which employees need that training. So you even know if you come in and you're an entry operator, you need to know these basic things, right? We need to train you up on how to do those. And then if you want to become that programmer, um, here's the other things you need to learn. Or if you want to be the shift lead, you know, before you're the programmer, right? You need to learn these additional skills, which are both technical and soft skills, right? If you're a lead, you need to know some management stuff. You need to know how to talk to people, how to, how to um, address conflict, because always, there's always going to be conflict, and you can address it in a healthy way, or you can address it in a non-healthy way. Um, so there's just a lot of really important stuff that... Uh, that shops should should be thinking about, I believe, to to build that culture well, where it really becomes like a beacon to attract, you know, attract talent. It's a small industry, right? People know each other. People, machinists know other machinists at other shops, or they have friends in the business. Right. And if you have uh, just an amazing culture, it will just draw people to you. Right. Um, and then once they come, you got to, you know, really make sure you're making them feel feel taken care of no doubt you have to be intentional i think the biggest thing i'm here you just be intentional and, and actually drive to help the people themselves i love the one-on-one -on -one advice i think too mm -hmm. often that goes we don't do the reviews until hr says it's time to do the review well right. that, you know a lot has happened and you can just you review. can just google a one-on-one one-on-one -on -one meeting form sometimes they're called o3s for one-on-one -on -one. so there's lots of them out there um and just start with a format work on it, do it, see how it feels, evolve it. That's right. Um, but yeah, having that personal connection and just talking about how are things going? How can I support you? Are there things that I'm doing that are bugging you? Yep. And you, if you ask that question, you have to ask it from a point of humility. No you doubt. can't get mad at an employee if they say, you know what actually bugs me when you ma micromanage me this way, right? Yeah. You'd be like, okay, I get it. I'm sorry. Let, let's talk about, you know, why I feel a need to do that or why I'm doing that. And, and, and let's make this better together. No doubt. I just read a book, uh, performance conversations. It's about the one-on-one -on -one and how mm -hmm. to have that. And, and 
to not be so structured, but the you know four or five questions that you always ask to, to kind of really open the conversation up to get real. But again, mm -hmm. it all comes. From, I love that you use humility because you're right. You can't come in firing. It, it's a oh, it's no. a chance to learn. <laughs> it's a chance to learn. You know, back and forth. I'm learning that myself with my teenage son. There you go. There right. you go. It, it, I, it gets yeah, real. Sometimes I come in firing, but that never works. That's right. Never ever works. That's right. I have young daughters myself. So I, I, trust me, I, it's the same way with uh, the, yep. the the females yep. on, in my house. So that's. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I know one one area we you talked about was quality, and, and there are a lot of quality people out there in the shops and and and, mm -hmm. and in the world. You know, what should they be thinking about when they're hearing this conversation? How should they change their process to create more alignment in that the overall strategy? Yeah, I think one of the most important aspects about that, if they're in quality, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to get everyone to to work within the systems, right? Quality has to be like the underpinning of everything that's done, right? If it's not, you don't really have anything. Um, you could deliver your parts on time or a day early all the time, but if they're not good, it doesn't matter if they were early. So um, one of the biggest challenges I th that we see in sort of the quality processes or quality systems of companies is that, like we talked about earlier, they are separated from the manufacturing process, right? They are in separate software, they're in separate paper documents, they're in separate binders, and the fact that that's where it exists and it's not really connected that well to the manufacturing process just causes a huge amount of friction and overhead cost and redundant you know data movement and migration and collection and it just it 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 becomes in some cases just so overwhelming that there isn't enough time to actually strategically work on quality right you're busy doing clerical stuff filling out forms and spreadsheets rather than digging into your root cause of what's causing scrap on the floor. So that's where quality people should really be spending the majority of their time. Um, and you know, we've, we've seen examples where when you go from a separate, you know, kind of isolated kind of quality system that's a little bit scattered and you align it into a really seamless way into manufacturing, I mean, you could have a quality manager free up half of their time every single day, right? Literally, I was doing four hours of work doing these things, and I no longer need to do any of that work. So imagine just how effective a quality person can be if they have half of their time freed up to then do more strategic things, right? to dig into those root cause analyses of why they're causing scrap or have a new initiative to, you know, go get a certification that they really should have to win some new customers. Um, so yeah, getting that all uh, aligned and getting rid of the waste. And one of the best ways to identify this is to do a value stream map. Look at your process really carefully and you Google it if you haven't done that before, um, get a, a small team of people to watch jobs go through the process, write down what all the steps are, how long it takes, what are they doing, why are they doing it, and then really dig into where can we eliminate steps, where can we eliminate waste, and part of doing that well is understanding waste from the like Toyota production system lean you know, concepts, right? right. Uh, motion, overproduction, scrap, uh, movement, you know, those kinds of things, um, those cost money. Your, your customers do not want to pay you to transcribe data from one sheet to another sheet, right? Or to put the same data in two different places. They just don't want to do that. They're not going to pay you for it. So it's not value added. So therefore it's waste. No doubt. And it sounds like there are several uh, examples you just went through of potential untapped growth for some of these businesses to take advantage of, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we, I had a customer just, just recently, only a 20 person shop who said, you know what, we just freed up so much time that we took one of our overhead staff, you know, and in a shop of 20 people, it's mostly shop people, not that many overhead people. They're like, we took this person, we completely eliminated their role 
and we put them into a more value added process. In fact, they moved them into quality in this case. They were in a completely admin position and they were able to put them into quality and, and really focus on you know improving and doing their process better. And that's that's um, a great story. Yeah. And so all these things we've been talking about, if you put them all together in sort of this you know, recipe for differentiation and have a, a well-executed strategy versus not having a well-executed strategy, that is the night and day difference between major growth and not major growth, right? For sure. Um, and, and it's those, the reason that I'm so passionate about this is that this manufacturing activity is the core of our entire economy, right? Let I me mean, look at the microphone in front of you and the arm that's all made up of either machine parts or parts that were stamped or molded or, you know, um, some other process, which those machines have a bon bunch of machined parts in them, right? Everything that we touch, everything that we do has a foundation in manufacturing. No doubt. Um, so it, as, so when a, when a shop can thrive, when they can grow, when they can hire employees, that is economic driving of growth in their in their local economies for their communities for the families of those that they employ and i don't think there's anything much more important than that for our whole country to thrive absolutely i think that was wonderful i, I loved how you summarized that i think you you basically you covered the why right there paul that was wonderful <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that is yeah that, that's certainly my why you yeah. know that's certainly my why that's, and that's um, well, you guys are doing a phenomenal job at Pro Shop, and what we'll do for all the listeners, we'll, we'll connect you directly with Paul. We'll have links in the show notes and, and, and make it really easy for you to, to, to go to Pro Shop. I think you got some really good videos. I, I've binged a lot of your videos out there just learning your mm -hmm. solutions. So, man, hats off to you guys. We're having a good time. We think it's important. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's supporting supporting small manufacturers is uh is 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 really important work and so it's it's our it's our passion it's our privilege to, to, to work with and talk to these shops and, and help them do better absolutely well thank you paul this is a this has been a fun conversation we haven't we haven't covered this topic for sure and it took me back to talking shop what i which i enjoyed so thanks for uh, embellishing me there well, thank you, Chris. Yeah, you, you have a class act here. I really appreciate your show and, and uh, all the topics you cover. It's, uh, it's my privilege. Thank you so much, sir. It's, it pleasure was all ours. You have a great day. All right, you too. Take care. Yes, sir. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.